So we have a few people trickling in. Uh, we'll get going here in a minute or two. Uh, thank you all for, um, if this is your first time for coming and this is your second time, thanks for coming back. Uh, I'm in a new room. Uh, my wife kicked me out of my bedroom. Uh, you can see that I'm in a room that looks like it's uh, been in a war zone. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a mother workshop earlier in the week and I set, I set the date of that workshop before I knew all this COVID stuff was going on um, because I figured by that date, by March 30th, I'd be done with cleaning up and renovating and painting this room. And I, I missed the deadline by a couple days, but uh, it's a little bit nicer than uh, sitting in my chair with kind of a crappy lighting. So, um, so anyway, looks a little bit better. And hopefully by the next time we do this, uh, there'll be some paint to cover up the, the spackle and the graffiti that my kids left on the wall. So, so we'll, we'll go ahead and get going. Um, thanks again for joining us. Uh, this is the second week that we've been trying to do these, this code club online. For those of you that are new, this is something that my lab has been doing over the last few years. Uh, we do it in person as part of our lab meeting about every week or about every other week. Someone will pick a topic, present it, break us up into groups of two, two or three people. We'll work through a problem and then come back. And so that's what I'm trying to do at a much larger scale. My lab has about eight people in it. Um, sometimes we get some guests to come, but uh, but to do it with you know 15 to 30 people. Um, via Zoom seems like a fun thing to try, um, especially during this time where everyone's schedules in a bit of flux and people kind of maybe want something concrete each week that they can look forward to. Uh, and, and another, you know, if you're not able to work at the bench, of course, and you have the bandwidth kind of mentally and emotionally to uh, start to learn some other skills and, and, and perhaps get a little bit stronger with your programming skills. And so, um, as I mentioned last time, uh, the, the number one rule in this when I break people up into pairs uh, is do not be a jerk. I really, really have no tolerance for people being jerks to each other. Uh, the feedback I got last week is that people really enjoyed meeting other people that were perhaps from the other side of the world, from labs that they knew of but had never met this member of that lab. Uh, so it's, it's meant to, we're supposed to learn something, but I think more importantly, it's also an opportunity for us to get to know other people and to um, and, and have some fun while we're doing it. So being a jerk is not, not part of that. So in, in the feedback I got in the questionnaire that I gave at the end of the, the lesson, one of the things people were interested in was more about how do we get data into a format so that we can work with it. And so what I'm gonna talk about today, uh, my plan is to talk for maybe uh, 10 or 15 minutes about two functions at, that are part of dplyr, and dplyr is a package that's part of the kind of omnibus uh, tidyverse package. Um, and, and those two, th two tools are called uh, rename and recode. And the data that I found that I thought was kind of quirky, kind of fun, uh, comes from 538. They did a, um, a poll and they asked two questions. Uh, they, wrote a paper, they wrote a story about one of them, one was on the use of the Oxford comma. And so um, this is the idea that if you've got a, li a list of say three or more things in a sentence that you separate by commas, um, the Oxford comma is, so if you had um, say the, um, the, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, so the example that I, um, so if we said uh, Bob, Sally, and Joe, Right, we would say Bob, comma, Sally, comma, and Joe. That that comma before the and is called an Oxford comma. And then so some cases, people will leave out that comma, right? And so uh, there are various memes online of what, um, you know, what happens if you leave out that Oxford comma, um, leading to some somewhat humorous uh, predicaments for some of the characters in the sentence. The other question they asked was whether or not uh, the word data is plural. Um, so in the Latin, data is plural. <laughs> whether or not we actually use data as plural is another issue, right? Um, so we might say the data, the data show um, versus the data shows, or uh, the data are um, indicating this versus the data indicates this, right? 
um, or the data is, data are, data is, which do you prefer, right? And so um, the, the grammatically correct is to treat data as plural, but uh, we, I think even I in my pedantic points need to accept that data evolves or that grammar evolves as we use it. And so anyway, they collected about 1,200, 1,100 observations where they did a survey and asked people um, Oxford comma usage, where the data is plural, and they asked them some other data. Anyway, so that's kind of the background on this data set. Um, they've made it accessible uh, to the public through a link on GitHub. And so what I'd like to do, like I said, is take 10 minutes here and do a, kind of a, a brief overview of how we might use these two commands and why we would use them, the recode, the rename and recode function. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here to our studio and hopefully you were able to follow the setup instructions to get our studio set up. I'm going to come up here to the upper left corner where you see the, the green circle with the white plus in it to open up a new R script. And I'm going to take these three lines of code from my prompt. So library tidyverse, GitHub, left arrow, read CSV in this link, and then the word GitHub. Okay, so I'm going to uh, copy and paste. Uh, one of the things that hopefully you're noticing is that you can read data into R from a website, which is pretty slick, right? So this data set is available as a CSV or comma separated value file on GitHub. So I don't have to download the file. I'm going to read it directly from the internet. And so to run, uh, I'm going to go ahead and save this script to my, um, to my desktop. And I'll save this as um, 2020-04-02-CodeClub. R. Hope you all had a good April Fool's Day yesterday. My kids enjoyed it immensely at my wife and my expense. Anyway, so whether or not you save it isn't, isn't that big of a deal, but it helps to kind of uh, propagate this as we're going forward. So to run these three lines, I can highlight the whole thing. I can highlight all three lines and then click source. Alternatively, I can put my, my cursor on the line and then hit the run button. Um, so I'll go ahead and do that. So the first command we run is library tidyverse, which loads the functions from the tidyverse package. The cursor jumps down to my line three now to read the CSV file. So I'll run that. And the output from read CSV gives us a bunch of information about how, uh, so it says parsed with column specification. So it tells us how the columns were read in. So respondent ID was read in as a double. Um, in your opinion, which sentence is more grammatically correct? Question mark. That column was read in as a character and so forth. So if I run, so this GitHub is the variable that the data frame, this data table has been assigned to. So if I run GitHub on its own um, and make this a little bit bigger, what it's telling me is that it's a tibble that's 1,100 rows and 13 columns. You'll see that the column names are really long, right? So in your opinion, something, um, prior to reading something, right? So these are really long column names. And they're really nice for us to read, right? So if we're looking at that CSV file, if we wanted to read the column names, they'd be really easy to read. We'd know exactly um, what the question was that they asked in the survey. But for working with computers, working for R, these names just are really <laughs> horrible. Um, things like spaces, punctuation, um, capitalization, um, these are all things that just make it really hard to work with in R. Um, but, and I think this, I mean, this is somewhat artificial, right? That we're taking this from 538, but in reality, it's, it's kind of real, right? So I work with collaborators, clinicians. They give me data with information about the patients, or um, I might work with soil scientists and they might send me data off of their machine. And the column names or the variable names that they're giving me um, might be formatted kind of like this, right? 
And so I don't want to go in and change the raw data they give, they've given me. I want to use an R script to modify the files so that I can reproducibly go from the raw data they gave me to the data I'm working with. And so the first command we're going to learn is rename. And so rename will allow us to rename our columns to have a certain name. Uh, the recode will allow us to take something like uh, the values in this sentence, it's important, and whatever follows, and to simplify that or to change it to um, some other value, right? So we might take yes and no, and we might prefer to change that to true or false. Okay. So um, that's where we're going. Um, and we'll do some exercises in our, in our small groups to, to test that out. All right. So if we want to see the names of our columns, we can use the call names function. And again, we can then hit run, or you can do command return to run that line, and it'll then run it in the console down here. I'm going to make my window bigger because I don't need that stuff over on the right. And these are the column names that were at the top of our GitHub data frame. Right, so these are really long uh, column names, and they've got punctuation, they've got various capitalization. It's kind of a mess. It's not something that I really would want to work with. So what we're going to do is we're going to use rename to change those. So the syntax for rename I'm showing here. Uh, if hopefully you can see my Safari screen, but the syntax is to say rename the name of the data frame that we want to rename. And then a new name equals an old name. We can then add a comma and then add other column names. So we can do new name two, old name two. Um, and I notice in here I've got a small syntax error. But if your column name has a space in it, you need to have quote marks around that name. Because again, R hates spaces. Um, I have a typo here that this new name two should also have quotes around it because it has a space in it. Um, hopefully, I can convince you, though, uh, that we do not want spaces in our new names. We want to keep them um, uh, in, a, in a nice nice format. And if you want a space, um, that I really encourage you to use an underscore, like we did here for new name one or new name two. Uh, something else that's built into the plier is this piping function. So we can say data frame, pipe that into rename. Um, and I have another typo here I need to fix um, so that we don't, we don't need this data frame in here. Sorry about that. So we can see this with real code. Um, so using the, the GitHub data frame, I can say rename GitHub, the data frame, and so take the respondent ID column, that's the old column name, and rename it respondent. I can also take the column in your opinion, which sentence is more grammatically correct and rename that as Oxford or not. Okay. We can also do it using this, this pipe type of notation. And so what we can do to show you this is if we do GitHub, I like the piping because it more directly shows, at least in my sense, of how things are getting moved through the data. And so we can do GitHub, rename, and so we're going to say the new column. So I'll say respondent equals quote respondent ID. I don't need the quotes there because there's no space. But for consistency, I like leaving them in there. It, it's not critical. Um, I can also look at um, Oxford or not equals, and then in quotes, this sentence, and I want to include the whole thing. In your opinion, which sentence is more grammatically correct? So we're going to take that long column name and convert it to Oxford or not. I can highlight those two lines, hit run, and then when I look at my column names, those first two column names have been changed to respondent and Oxford or not. So this is the rename function. And I'm going to have an exercise uh, for you to work with a partner on to think about how you would rename some of the other columns. 
So another variable that we might think about, um, another thing we might want to do is change the value of our columns to make it a little bit simpler. So one of the handy functions to use with dplyr is select. So if I do select respondent and then Oxford or not, select will return those two columns for me. So let's see what this sentence actually is in the Oxford or not column. And so what you'll see is that the sentence is, it's important for a person to be honest, kind, and loyal, either without the Oxford comma or with the Oxford comma. So what I'd like to do is to take the sentence that's in the, with the Oxford comma and to turn it into a, into a value that says Oxford. If it doesn't have the Oxford comma, I'll say not Oxford, right? And so I'll go ahead and um, leave that there for now. And I will use this recode function and Looking over at my web page, the recode function um, takes two, kind of merges two functions. So the first is mutate. And mutate is a special function that we'll have to talk about at another code club. But mutate allows us to change a column. So we're going to change a column. The column we're going to change is um, uh, is Oxford or not. Um, I'm seeing I've got some bugs here in my code. I'm sorry. Or, or sorry, this is my um, right. This is my demo of of the general generic syntax. So we're going to change a column. The column I want to change is the column that I want to recode. So the the code I'm going to re the column I'm going to recode equals running the recode function on the column I want to recode. Right. So we're basically creating a new column, but we're writing that new column back over the old column. Hopefully that makes sense when we look at a real example. We then take the old value and set it equal to the new value. One of the things I hate about recode and rename is that with recode, you say old equals new. With rename, it's new equals old. Okay. So uh, what the syntax here then is, is that we will say mutate Oxford or not equals recode, and we're going to recode the Oxford or not column. And then take the, it's important for, for the, the version without the Oxford comma and say that's non-Oxford and the one with the Oxford comma and say that's Oxford, okay? So what we'll do is again, I need to do mutate and I'll say Oxford or not equals recode and I'm gonna recode the Oxford or not column And I'm going to take the old value and assign it to a new value. So I'm going to copy this first example, including the period. I'm going to put it in quotes and say that equals um, non-Oxford, N-O-N underscore Oxford. And then I'm going to say copy the second sentence with the Oxford comma. and say that equals Oxford. Okay. And so then we have two cl closing parentheses, one to close for the recode function and one to close for the mutate. And so now if I run this, I see that my two columns have the respondent ID and those sentences have been changed to non-Oxford or Oxford. So again, this is rename and recode. Something we can do if we want to know how many people did the Oxford versus non-Oxford is we could say add to this the function count, Oxford or not. And this will then count the number of people that used or preferred the Oxford comma versus those that didn't. Okay. So again, we included this select line here to get rid of all the other columns. If you want to include all those other columns, 
we would remove this select line. So if I go ahead and remove that and then run these lines, ah, uh, it, it does the same thing, but if I get rid of this count, then we see the full data frame, right? We see the all 13 columns, but our first two columns have been modified, right? So I know this is going fast. The information is in here in these two sections on rename and recode. And what I'm going to have you do with your breakout group is spend, um, say, 10, 15 minutes using the rename function to rename more of the columns in the data frame, right? So I renamed two of the columns, the first two columns. Go ahead and see if you can rename some of the other columns. Come up with good variable names for them. Uh, maybe talk with your partner about what you think makes for a good column name. Then I'd like you to use the recode function to recode the values in more of the, in more of the columns. Um, and, um, and then finally, uh, as a stretch for, uh, for homework if we don't get to it, but you could think about this is my code um, for effectively doing what we just did, getting, but getting the percentage of people that use the Oxford comma or not. And what I'd encourage you to do is to think about um, what fraction of people would use data as singular versus as a plural word. So again, we'll take um, maybe 25, 30 minutes here to have you all break up into teams. I'll split you all up into different groups. Um, before I do that, uh, are there any questions that anyone has before I uh, split you up into pairs? I had a good question. Sure. So if I run the call names GitHub, I don't see the change in the name of the columns. Is that right? Right, so you won't see that in the name of the columns because, um, because we haven't written things back to GitHub. We're taking that data frame and we're modifying the columns, but we're not saving it back to GitHub. If I would have done, um, say, um, new GitHub, left arrow, and then assigned that to the pipe, then when I run this, new GitHub, has the modified columns. But because I never saved that back to GitHub or assigned it back to GitHub, then uh, we don't see it. All right, great, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So let me stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna assign you all to pairs. Um, And, uh, and so go ahead, um, introduce yourself to your partner. Um, when we're about halfway through, I'll send you a reminder to maybe um, transition from renaming columns to trying to recode values. And um, don't feel bad if you don't get to that third question that's really meant as a, a stretch if you can get there or for homework for something to follow up on uh, later in the week to reinforce some of what we've talked about today, okay? So, um, I'll go ahead and split you up, and then I'll give you a few minute warning when we're close to the end, and we'll come back and, and report back our results. Okay. Hopefully, uh, uh, you found that interesting or good process of working through how to rename columns and a, how to recode variables. One of the groups I popped in with talked about how um, it's a challenge to take like these really long names that are actually descriptive, right? Because they're using like 10 words, um, and how do you condense that down to something that is descriptive and informative and captures kind of the essence of, of what the column name was. So let, um, so we've got two exercises, and like, or I guess three if, if people got to it. Um, does anyone want to share with us how they went about doing the first exercise of using the rename function? Would anyone like to share their screen and show what their group did? No one? 
All right. So maybe I'll go ahead and show mine. <laughs> um, there's no, the, the only right answer is getting an answer, right? So there's many ways to do things in R. And so don't be um, ashamed if yours isn't beautiful. Um, uh, that's fine. If it works, it's beautiful. <laughs> um, and show, so I'll, I'll show you the solution that I've, I think I've posted, um, is that, uh, hopefully you can see this here, that uh, I took the various old names that were provided. Uh, so what we did was, in your opinion, which sentence is more grammatically correct? And so I changed that, of course, to Oxford or not. And then the next question was, prior to reading about it above, had you heard of the serial or Oxford comma? So serial comma is also known as the Oxford comma. And so then I renamed that, heard of Oxford, right? So um, I don't know, like, I think this last one important, or this one importance of grammar was maybe a little bit longer than I wanted it to be just cause it's, I don't know, I'm lazy, right? I don't wanna type more than I have to. Um, but you can hopefully see that so the, the, big, the big thing is finding good column names to replace these very long name, um, sentences with. And, um, and so thinking about, again, how do you make that descriptive? How do you make it concise? I try to keep everything lowercase because I don't wanna have to worry if something was uppercase or down, up lowercase or, you know, like household income here was, both words were uppercase, whereas in some of these others, um, it was like, you know, a sentence case. So anyway, um, this was the recodes or the, this is the rename, sorry for the typo, um, the rename step that I wrote um, where we took respondent and used that in place of respondent ID and how I then plugged in my new column names in replacing the old column names. And so if you run this, so I'll go ahead and copy this um, over here. And I think if I'm in a code chunk that's connected by these pipes, if I'm anywhere in it, I think I can leave my cursor there, hit run, and it will run the whole code chunk. And so I ended this with call names and so then you can see the column names as they came out, or if I get rid of that and run the code chunk again, you can see that the data frame now has those column headings, all right? So hopefully you were able to get one or two other column names changed. Um, I had all day to work on this, so I had plenty of time to do it. I, I only gave you maybe 10 or 15 minutes to work on this one, so don't feel bad that you didn't get them all done. Um, the next exercise is would anyone, has anyone worked up any courage that they want to try to take on describing to us what they did for, um, renaming or I'm sorry, recoding a column. Sure. I can uh, do that. Uh, I'm Pranav. Sure. sure. I'll, uh, stop sharing my screen and then you can share yours if that's okay. So go ahead. Um, so we looked at uh, the column, uh, how would you write the following sentence? So that column had uh, the header as uh, this particular question here. Then we use rename to change that header into E's or R because the options uh, that people either responded were either some experts say it's important to drink milk, but the data are inconclusive, or they say, but the data is inconclusive. So we changed the, uh, the sentence that had the word R as R, and the word, uh, if the sentence had the word is, we changed it to is. So we used the same syntax, we used mutate, uh, created a new column, uh, is or R, then recoded that uh, to either R or is based on the sentence it had. And, yeah. Great. Very good. And so it looks like you were trying some other things down below with 
calling columns. So good. So that's exactly what I did. Um, let me, if you want to go ahead and stop sharing your screen, um, I can come back and share mine. And so if, if you look at my exercise too, um, I took the same column um, instead of, I think you called it is R, I called it singular or plural. And I recoded singular or plural. Um, again, for the one that is inclusive, inconclusive, I said singular, R inconclusive, I said plural. Um, perhaps what you could have done would be to say, um, rename this column to be plural. And then you could say, is inconclusive equals false, are inconclusive equals true, right? So there are many ways to do this. Uh, just because this is how I did it, doesn't, that doesn't make it right, right? This is, it works for me and perhaps works for what I want to do with subsequent analysis. Um, and so then if I go ahead and copy this, um, into my R script and run that, I get a table that says 228 people use data um, as uh, plural and 865 as singular. And 36 people, uh, I think, were perhaps confused by the question or perhaps they didn't get that far, excuse me, in the survey. And um, we can tack onto it this final line to get the percentage, but I think it's clear that um, so about 76% of people said in this sentence data was singular, and about 20% said it was plural, and about 3% didn't know. Okay. And there are other things that we could do, and we can talk about perhaps in future sessions. If you've got data that's an NA, how could we get rid of the NA? So we're only looking at um, values from people that had an opinion. Okay. So hopefully this made sense and thinking about how we can work with data. Again, one of the big motivations here is that if we get raw data from a website or from a collaborator, uh, we don't wanna change the raw data. We wanna leave it raw and that we wanna use a script to um, modify that data frame so that we can work with it going forward. That'll help make our analyses more reproducible. And if people have questions about how we coded things or how we worked with it, we can show them the script and kind of the provenance of all our data, okay? So um, any questions that people had about using rename or recode? You can raise your hand if you want in the, under the participants or under uh, your name, I think, if you have a question. Or you can unmute yourself and just ask. People seem kind of bashful. Hi, Pat. Yeah. So I have a question. I'm not exactly sure how to frame it, but if downstream, I, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to be like partitioning this data if it's like a binary answer. Um, are those times when you might have utility in using a more generic true, false, or yes, no, and having the um, header be more indicative of the content? Yeah. So, um, so the question about like partitioning the data. Um, there's a function called group by, and so you could take your data frame and group it by um, singular or plural, right? So the singular or plural column, um, we could group by singular or plural and then do some analysis. So I think there was something in here about age, right? So we could say, what's the average age of people that want to use singular or plural? So um, maybe what I could do uh, just here in the closing minutes is that I would add to this group by singular or plural. And then, so then I'm gonna take my data frame and split it into people that think it's singular and those that think it's plural. And I could then do summarize and I could say um, mean age equals mean age and then N equals N. And so this then, um, uh, so I have to add something here. Hmm. 
I've got some bug in here somewhere. Um, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Um, anyway, this this would even though it's not working right now, you, you can kind of see it for the n that it's taking the data frame, it's partitioning it by singular or plural or an a, and then within each of those groups, it's then um, it's then reporting back out, uh, hopefully theoretically the average age. <laughs> Um, or the number of individuals. So that's one way you could do it. If you wanted to get out, say you wanted to exclude people that thought it was singular, um, you could then use filter, and filter might work easier with uh, a true false, but it's also not that big of a deal to say singular plural equals singular and work with that group. And so those filter steps um, and this group by might be something that we work with in the next couple of weeks um, as we kind of think about these deep plier pipelines of analyzing data. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong in this <laughs> set of commands. It should work, but anyway. Um, uh, all right, so this brings us to the top of the hour and I wanna thank you all for uh, participating in your questions. We'll be back again next Thursday at three o'clock. Uh, I'll try to post a teaser earlier in the week with the link, and then um, usually around one o'clock on Thursday, I'll post the prompt and kind of the activity for the day. So uh, please tell your friends and colleagues to join us, and um, have a good week, and we'll talk to you soon. Stay healthy. <laughs>